Okay, this is one of, I don't know, it's got to be 25, 30 of them, of videos that i am promised to redo over the last two years, and have really only gotten to do one of them. And, well, actually two, because I took some of the information from the, one of the vids, anyhow. And uh, so I'm redoing them. Things that I got cross-linked on the one deal are, uh, I believe this video was... Uh, turned off because it had a 15 second clip of Bedney Hughes whenever it found here. This is uh, so I'm starting this again from a different point of view but still basically the same information will be kept within it. So stick with me or grab a cup of coffee and uh, so this the statement here, Tutankhamun's great grandmother found to have blonde hair and who this is is Thuya. There's Thuya and Yuya it's spelled commonly T-H-U-Y-U-A, but in reality of their spelling, it was T-J-U-Y-U. So whenever they try to make it sound like Thu Yu Nyu Yu, it really wasn't like Timmy and Tammy. Well, it was more like Timmy and Tammy than it would be for somebody to be exactly like Thu Yu Yu Yu. It, regardless, what we're... Uh, looking at here is her mummy and uh, it used to be on exhibit and well it still is kind of and it got hurt during the uh, 2011 debacle thing that happened there but that's neither here nor there for it's still in decent shape but she's shown here and you can see that uh, they, they claim that these are the, some of the best mummies they ever made you know Ramses and all that series there uh, seems to have been a real good job too and it's perhaps they were able to do them directly after they passed away there was no waiting the natron worked the best the humidity was in the air the stars aligned whatever it is but you can see that uh, they didn't really shellac up her real bad like you see King Tut and so you see a lot more of her natural skin coming through here which is kind of a red ochre brown but that's uh, because she's been basically soaked in natron. Natron is what they use to taxidermy and like make tanning, uh, tanning for uh, leather and stuff like that. And you know how it darkens leather and stuff and beef jerky basically. Bob Breyer's got a video where he takes this pale looking Irish man and does him and he turns this dark easy. But it looks like they didn't do all the extra things for it looks like that secondary shellacking was like if they didn't do it real good and some of the ones that they preferred to just wrap up might have been in the idea that they didn't do it real good. Like if you've ever been to a funeral and it doesn't really quite look like grandma and such again. But anyhow, you can see her curly blonde hair soft and it doesn't have an application on it where other ones do and stuff and they've said well it, it must be um, henna on her hair and everything and and they say no it really doesn't have henna she has a blonde a strawberry blonde hair and uh, so let's get into this new evidence is emerging which suggests that at least some of the ancient Egyptians were white Europeans now that's an odd way to describe it because they wouldn't be white Europeans at this time they would be Caucasian Egyptians that I keep talking about but what you would think of nowadays as being found mainly in Europeans and what you would call white people and I'm sure that the darkening of the mummies and stuff probably confuses some people but it really shouldn't whenever you see beef jerky and how it turns and stuff and if you ever look at look up Bob Breyer Mr. Mummy and it'll show you where he actually does one to the T from the ancient books and everything and uh, what it actually looks like and comes out I don't want to do that try to throw that clip in here I although I've thrown it in a couple of old old videos uh, and I don't think it ever got marked I've done that recently and done a clip that I did before again and it marked real quick whereas the other one is still going oh knock on wood okay so let's look into this this is from the Daily Star uh, Egyptian noblewoman Thuya, who is believed to have died about 1375 BC, is most widely known as being the great grandmother of legendary pharaoh Tutankhamun, and also would be the mother of Akhenaten and Queen Tai, and so on that you hear about. But we'll get into that later. Her tomb 
was found in 1905, so that was 18 years before King Tut, but it's rarely been opened. And uh, in a Channel 5 documentary, uh, The Nile, Egypt's Great River, historian Bedney Hughes was given a chance to witness such an occasion at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, and they opened it up, and she marveled about it, but what the clip was going to show is that whenever she marveled about it, and, and so she asked her kind of about the hair a little bit, made a, a comment, and uh, they said that they thought the natron process had done something to the hair and stuff, and uh, that wouldn't be the effect, because why would you have almost black hair, brown hair, chestnut, auburn, red, blonde, strawberry blonde, and so on. It makes no sense. And of course, they've already looked at this under microscope and it shows out to be Caucasian hair, so it's quite telling. It's something that I, I, I feel that they are somewhat embarrassed about, that it wasn't them that did it, but it's easy to see that they haven't done something like this in forever, and the people there are not currently. In fact, genetics show so, and maybe I'll flash at something that shows you that in here a second. The presenter then notices something strange, the strawberry blonde hair of the mummified body. And so here's a little video that they show of it. And uh, man, I don't want to get this flagged, but here it is, nearly 5,000 years old. Let's see if it's one of the best preserved mummies that we have. Best preserved they have. Julia. She was discovered two decades before her great grandson. When we look at her face, so that's Bethany Hughes there. So you're looking at her face, you can see some of it they've drawn, drawn serene or whatever, but you can also see the Caucasian phenotype in it, and there's all this gold gilding that's on it, and that's just like one of her boxes inside of a box inside of a box, if you will, the way that they build it. And over in the other part of the museum, they've got her, her giant box and another piece because they had found this, and whenever they did, it was not quite the King Tut in common, and people don't even realize this anymore, but this was the excitement, one of the excitements of Egypt that led to whenever they found Tutankhamun, it just, you know, oh my gosh, looky looky, and, you know, in the 1800s, everybody was mummy crazy and stuff like that. It was really quite the thing whenever people had figured out through some important archaeologist what there was to ancient Egypt. Do you think that could give us any genetic clues as to what Tutankhamun so she says that she's got a little slight overbite where the top teeth go over the bottom. I mean, it's not, not like, Ugh. but she said, uh, do you think by looking at the mummy, you might get a genetic idea of what Tutankhamun looked like? And I believe this is all the way back right while somebody was fixing to do a recreation of it. And we already have that recreation and it looks like Edward from the Vampire Slayer's really brother. Is that she's not born royal. There's a lot of social mobility. I mean, she starts off quite common, just has a priestess, and then she's in a splendid tomb with all of this gold and stuff. So the story is on her that she started out as a priestess of a moon and then married into what came and bred into the royalty of the 18th dynasty. So she married a prince. Can you smell that? When they say it smells like resins and incense. Resins and incense. Good. Sorry, it's, it's so quiet, but millennia old smell. That is amazing. This is closer than anyone normally gets to to you. They say this is closer than anyone normally gets to to you. They've taken the glass thing around. She's normally in a big glass case, and you're looking at it from a distance. And you can tell they haven't really wiped this down well and done the little alcohol water swab deal and things like that to it. They've left it somewhat the way that it was because it was pretty damn good to the way it was. I'm sorry to put it this way, but think about an old car. If you found like a 50 Chevy car that you could just wash a little bit and it looked good enough to where you didn't have to redo it or something like that, maybe you'd keep it in that same state. I think all of our conservatives are ready. So they're going to pull the lid off here. It's time to see how the lady herself is faring. They make sure all they all have hand spots and an extra guy holds on to it. Nobody's going to drop it or anything. Although it's made out of wood. I mean, hell, it's that old and stuff. And you wouldn't want to drop it and have any of that 
you know, gilding and the little insets of all the little jewels or anything, you know, no, 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 no. This thing is, I don't know if, if they've got some pillows they set it on over here behind them and everything, but you can tell real archaeologists are whenever they take the lid off and not just worrying about the lid, but they're so excited right here and uh, just pretty much taking their breath away, but wait, it gets worse. She talked about she's so tiny and perfect. Well, she's kind of been emaciated down a little bit, and I think she's only like 5'2, five 5'3, five something in that range. Somebody might correct me that really knows. I guess I should have looked it up, but I didn't. I don't think that it even in any of her information that I found actually states what they think her height was. But in a couple of places, they do mention her diminutiveness, or whatever, so she's a cute little lady. Oh, one thing about this, and I'll make a mention to it here later and show you something else, but uh, her eyes were known to be set in with this uh, puffing, which is more natural than most other ones. You find it in Ramsey's and a few other ones and stuff that ends up after the process being right and they've put inside their shell, uh, not shell pieces, but granite type pieces that have some pink fleck in it. And they use that for the whites of the eyes and then she has like what appears and they say even crystal blue eyes. I'll show you that here in a minute too, but of course it's got all the muck on it. And again, she's almost perfect like they say, so she's such a good mummy, they're gonna leave her alone. But, you know, it'd be neat if they did the little cleaning of the eye, but there might be uh, more than one political reason why they're not doing it. Again, you can see her little curly blonde hair right there. Look at her hair. So we're now looking at it real close, and she's saying, is that the original color to her? And now I'm just going to ruin it for you because you probably can't hear it because it's so crappy of audio, but uh, then she tries to say that the natron process probably did it to her. Well, we don't, we're not 100% sure, but when you're using natron, which you use for mummification, it's a bleach. So it's like putting salt in it and you go to the beach. And they're saying, well, it's like putting salt in your hair whenever you go to the beach. And just whenever you go swimming, you go in chlorine and stuff, so it'll have a knack of lightening your hair. But it has to have the ability to lighten <laughs> for you to have that so it might have taken her hair from something like oh let's see it might have taken her hair from something like that blonde there which has some mix in it which is what I look like pretty much now eh, maybe a little darker but get out in the sun see to something as light as that and uh, whenever I was a kid my sister used to put lemon in her hair and stuff and they would they would wet their hair and then put lemon in it and then t go out to tan and back then it was just real popular for people to tan and stuff and they had copper tone tan and all that stuff and band of soleil and people tried to get real dark and girls got these little books of stickers and they'd put a sticker right over here on their hip they started carrying this all the way through tanning beds and they would put the stickers in the same spot so you could see well I used to be this light or they would just pull down their bikini bottom just a hair and you could see how white that their butt was or whatever and you could see how much they were changing and of course women would know this if as soon as they change bikini styles whatsoever where the strap is and where it's not there's this little extra little line so you try to get rid of those somewhat and women would take the back strap off whenever they're laying face forward and everything like that and anyhow so she says, this is a somewhat bizarre phenomenon was explained away by Egyptologist on Channel 5 who said that it was unclear how her head got to be this color, saying we're not 100% sure if that's her original hair. Well, of course that's her original hair growing right out of her head, but, you know, hay is, you know, back then they didn't have hair salons that would dye hair and do things. Well, they kind of did. They had the first hair salons. They found... Uh, little brass rods that look like they're and, and with women to where you could say well it's nothing more than they would heat this thing up over a fire spin their hair around it hold on to it and let loose in fact they do it to a lot of mummies and everything in preparation but women would have done this all the time probably more opulent the person the more they would have that done <coughs> pardon me 
One of the reasons offered for the color of the hair is the use of natron in the mummification process. This naturally occurring mixture of sodium carbonate decahydrate, which is also an ancient household insecticide, was primarily used for making leather and to bleach clothing. This implies the use true hair color might have been deliberately lightened to give it blonde look or may have occurred accidentally through mummification. And I'm here to tell you that I think it tells you right here below it. It's either this article or the other one we'll go into. And it, it explicitly tells you that uh, they tried to do it with the natron and it doesn't. The natron is not a bleach. And whenever they do it to bleach clothing, it's, it's a caustic, real high alkaline type thing. If it, you soak your hand, you can, if you were to take and wet your hand and stick it in it, it'll start to burn. Whenever I was running saltwater aquariums, they have all those chemicals in there and stuff, and you and if you hold on to the salt and get it in water, it'll burn. In fact, you if you are wet and you stick it into this stuff, a lot of the calciums that they use and stuff like that, reacting with the salt at that time, will start to burn. And they've talked about how they've been mummies burnt from this process too, so it had to be done correctly. But this implies through your true hair color might have been deliberately lightened. Uh, to give it a blonde look or may have occurred accidentally through mummification. But blonde Egyptians, in the last section when I referred to the vast majority of other ancient Egyptian mummies having dark brown hair, well, uh, I choose those words very carefully because according to Dr. Janet Davey from the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine Australia, some of the ancient Egyptians were naturally blonde and sometimes red-haired. And I actually have this video right here, and it didn't get flagged. Well, it got flagged, and so I put it in again with two little chips taken out of it. It didn't flag, and they let it fly. This is basically Mike at Beyond Science here, and this is just one little section of it that shows where this woman has got chestnut-type hair, and it's all curled and braided and everything, and red and blonde hair, and even this famous ancient queen is drawn on the wall. And what's neat is, and I show in this other video, right there it looks like orange hair, kind of reddish orange hair, real ginger, if you will. And But if you go closer to it, you can see that it's red ochre lines on yellow. And that it looks orange from a distance. And that's neat how they were able to pull off that color, because apparently when they tried to make the other, it was like a red ochre color, darker red auburn, and they didn't like like that it didn't match her or something and she's quite the fair lady but quite often there's just this symbology that's done uh, in their art and people say well something else that confuses them is the art well in reality this red ochre males and pale females as you see all through their art is something that's carried on through them and all people through the ancient fertile crescent really where they they are now hunter gather farmers and stuff the women keep the children in the house therefore they don't have to toil as much they won't get as tanned as the men it seems to go right along this line and to keep women fair and we still have this to this day and you think it's not bad not too long many generations ago and people were powdering themselves yeah, just my mom used to powder, all women powder themselves and stuff, and and to, to look more fair, but you think that's bad, go back to ancient England and stuff, and people were white chalk powdering themselves to be just like porcelain, basically. So, you can see it carry through time, things like that, but that symbolic art has been shown for the Greeks, for the Mitanni, from the Minoans, and uh, all people through Anatolia and stuff, whenever they have their arts and tombs and everything, that there are red ochre males and pale females and some nobility and priests are drawn as light and stuff, but then they are probably inside more and done a different way, and there's a symbology for that too. So it all goes with it. And of course all the wigs they've ever looked at and things are Caucasian hair. You can easily tell by looking at it. An article recently published by the Sydney Morning Herald explains that most researchers claim different colors of the mummy hair resulted from the chemical reactions of the mummification process itself in natron. And uh, what's odd about that claim, let me get this centered again, what's odd about that claim is that how could it be all the way from light blonde to sandy blonde to get, how would you get all those variations out of it? You know? 
and 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 you couldn't and <laughs> and to be uniform or anything like that so Dr. Davies undertook a series of innovative experiments covering 16 hair samples from Egyptian people in the salty ash for 40 days, yes, including black people and even some gray hair. And not a single change in hair color was observed. And they have this scale thing that's kind of like your teeth getting wider and it's just very slight differences. And there were no differences from a chestnut, from an auburn, from a black hair, from a black person's hair. None of them changed one shade at all and uh, somebody said after this that they had took them and just set some in there and left them in there although the mummification process is 40 days and this is that symbolic 40 days in the Bible and so on like that and 40 it carries all through the Phoenicians and it's a real important number for certain things uh, like quarantine which we've recently been on whose actual linguistic connection is 40 days that they used to make people wait whenever there was perhaps a plague going around or things before they would allow in to show that they had it so you think people were running in out of harbors all the time and there was an effective a quarantine maybe I ought to do a video about it but I'm about sick of this quarantine aren't y'all more from the independent in 2018 tomb secrets the FBI cracks the DNA code on ancient Egyptian mummies L'Oreal's examination showed that Dehuti Nacht DNA, and he's from the 12th dynasty, back even much further, pre Hyksos, pre whatever. By the way, this 18th dynasty is well after the Hyksos, and they kicked them all out, da da da. And people try to, whenever they see information like this, they try to write it off as something, and it's, it's not able to be done. Uh, Jehudi Knox carries clues to another mystery. For centuries, archaeologists and historians have debated the origins of the ancient Egyptians. Now closely related, they were to modern people living in North Africa. To the researcher's surprise, the governor's mitochondrial DNA indicated that his ancestry on his mother's side, our haplogroup, was Eurasian. And it's like U6. And uh, Seven Phoenician Seven's got a video on it. Now she's got a channel at Egyptologist Seven. Everybody ought to check it out and uh, she, she shows genetic information. That's something that I don't really delve in very much. I've stolen from her videos a few times and some of her articles that she'll show up, I'll find them and be able to pull it up and go look. And uh, I've got one of them here in just a minute. No one will ever believe us. So our happily group was Eurasian. And she said, no one will ever believe us, L'Oreal recalls, telling her colleague, Jody Irwin, there's a European haplogroup group and an ancient Egyptian mummy. Irwin, the supervisor biologist in the FBI's DNA support unit, had similar concerns to verify the results. They sent a portion of the tooth to a Harvard lab and then to the Department of Homeland Security for further sequencing. Then last year, as the FBI scientists worked to confirm their results, another group affiliated with the Max Planck Institute for Science of Human History in Germany reported the first successful extraction of ancient DNA from Egyptian mummies in a burial ground that even predated um, all these other ones except for Jakuti not backed all through and it showed a continuation and they thought um, anyhow let me finish this reading and I'll say it and the results showed that their ancient Egyptian samples were closer to Middle Eastern and European samples than to even the modern Egyptians who have more sub-Saharan African ancestry and so what is that saying well, it says that the ancient Egyptian people have these haflo groups that all show that they come from Proto-Indo-European, Anatolian, farmer-type people, and you know they came in and started the first farming. So that's where that comes from. And all over the Fertile Crescent, these same blue-eyed type people, and we'll get to that blue-eyed thing in a minute, but in blonde hair, if you will. Uh, red, chestnut, all kinds. You don't have to have all blonde hair and you don't have to have blue eyes. Your sister doesn't have blue eyes, but you and your mom and dad do or whatever, you know, so it's it's a genetic thing to hold. People try to say if you don't have it, then there must be some mix in your family. and You got it and all this stuff. That's a different topic altogether, but um, so from these mummies, what they were expecting to find and uh, let me go ahead and switch up here. What they were expecting to find was um, 
a, uh, the difference of what happened in their genetics. And so it would have been something to look at, and because people are getting pretty good at this genetic crap, right? They were gonna be like, okay, now we can see when the Persians come in, and you can see when the Akkadians come in, and how things change, and then you can see when the Greeks come in, and then you see when the Romans come in. And there's some admix that happens during that time, and by the end we end up at X. And there are things to, nope, it seems to ride all the way through like they didn't accept much admix at all from any of those people or maybe they had the same similar haplogroups if there was any and that the sub-Saharan African ancestry is in post-Roman periods. And here's the paper and I'm not going to read this whole thing to you. I've, I've written uh, versions on it but they present 90 mitochondrial genomes right and they're telling you that uh, no it's not true and uh, so they want to talk about Libyans Assyrians Kushites Persians Greeks Romans and then the difference of it Arabs and Turks and Brits and what the difference would be movement of people and the ideas given rise to cultural genetic change and where things went and who was who back in the day and you know they talk about how uh, we're all a species with amnesia somewhat seems like all of us they refer to King Tutankhamun's family as being R1B and also being a European haplogroup but if you look at the this Thuya and Yuya that we've been looking at then you might realize why that would be that effect see because King Tut's children didn't pass on any genes because his two kids are supposedly, you know, they were stillborn or whatever. And, but, and so people have tried to say, well, okay, there was ca that Caucasian type of people there then, but before that there weren't. And it's like, okay, well, this is fifth dynasty right here. This is one of scribes. And so this would have been princes and nobility of generations gone past if you will and princes that weren't the first in line and all those things and getting taught scribal work and I've got a video where a guy talks about how on one of the tombs of the scribes it talks about how it's passed from father to son to father to son and other people will not know the secrets how to make the certain paints and how to do all the certain things with it and uh, so what's neat about this is these crystal blue eyes and that what this article is about is these crystal blue eyes and they even put them in some cats and things like that this is Horaha this is the second pharaoh ever so first dynasty second pharaoh ever they found it somewhat in a cache in a later tomb so they're confused as to whether or not it was built somewhat later and then put in with the cache of all the stuff and supposed to have been a representative of him from ancient times or if this is even from way back when before they were doing all these things out of super stone and it's one of the last wooden forms of them but uh, you know it has a headdress and pops to it too and you can see it's grayish blue eyes and if you get uh, to a certain angle they look real blue you know all you have to do is look up blue-eyed Egyptians and it shows you this effect but so let's uh let's look at one more telling of this Thuya and Yuya and their connection to King Tut, Tutankhamun, and this is the parents of Amenhotep III, oh sorry, this is the parents of Amenhotep III, which is basically the Moses type figure who brought the very first monotheism to Egypt. And there are other people that did too, like Mithraism has looked as very much so, but there's still some pantheon going on, and there was still some pantheon going there too, but they were saying there was this main one. In the Bible, if you check into it real closely, even God himself, when he's talking, says there are other gods for other people, but these are my people, and this type of thing. But in that, it also says us and we, and let's make them in our image, and all this, and that's plural too. And I've made some videos about how that comes from other religions in the first place. And that God had a wife named Asherah. And uh, 
yep, this Yahweh character and stuff in ancient times and ball worship and everything else that went along with it. And they dished it for that one God who is basically Saturn worshiping, but people don't understand what all entails in Saturn worshiping for that's actually a false or a reverse representation of the sun in his 12 year orbit that goes around. But that's not what this video is about. But I'm going to get into that topic. I'm just happy I'm finally be able to make one of these that uh, I have to redo. I mean, I've got like 26 left or something, but uh, that's okay. I've only done a couple of them since I did that in the first place, and most of those were parts that were put in other ones, and I go, okay, that was good enough, and I marked it off. The magnificent tomb and treasures of the forgotten couple, Thuya and Yuya, and you saw that headwear there that they basically call a face mask. Or death mask. A couple known as Thuya and Yuya gave Egyptian royalty at least one, but perhaps even two famous officials. Their daughter, Tai, was the wife of Amenhotep III, that's who we know as Akhenaten, the mother of Akhenaten, and the grandmother of Tutankhamun himself, which we know is the boy king, and really he's not the most famous one, but what made him so famous is we found him, and what it made it so special was that they had basically tried to write off Akhenaten and his lineage that went out of, from him because of him trying to change the religion and things. So uh, the couple may have also had a son named I, and that comes into play somewhat later. We'll talk about that maybe. Their family was important, but so was their tomb, one of the most magnificent discoveries in Egyptology. I is the one that took over after Tutankhamun and they always said there might have been some foul play in there but I think there's a lot more to it I'll probably do one on Tut it's a separate thing though Yuya and Thuya were Egyptian nobles whose names became famous among the beginning of the 20th century when their final home was discovered researchers couldn't believe their eyes that even took place almost two decades before Carter discovered the tomb of their grandson and in whose times it was perhaps the greatest golden treasure of Egypt. What do you see? Wonderful things. Here's their chair and it's a gilded chair. This may be a recreation because I thought the original looks torn up. And uh, lion footed bottoms. And we see that all the way through architecture taken even to modern days. And some of the tables my grandma had and stuff like that. It's only Art Deco and past that we've left this same little constant architecture. Uh, a replica of the chair of Princess Sidamun, 18th dynasty of Egypt, an artifact from the tomb of Yuya and Thuya. And this shows you that whenever somebody died, a lot of times people gave up things. I've, I've thought quite often that when they found out somebody died, instantly somebody might even do something. She might even be sitting in her badass chair. Somebody even talked about how badass it was right then. She found out somebody died, she stands up, she goes, this is going and sets it aside right then. Make me another chair. What? I need a chair to sit on. Don't bring me some bullshit. And they're like, oh my God, we got to put it together. We, it's the, you, somebody get in the woodworking shop. It's after hours. Whatever. The tomb of a forgotten couple. The tomb known as KV-46 in the Valley of the uh, Kings, which was the original picture on this article here where it showed that pyramid at the top that's really the overlook of it and they used to cave in parts of that and let it flow over and hide the tombs. The construction of the tomb is characteristic of the style of the 18th dynasty and its walls were not decorated. Providing even less interest today is the fact that it now stands empty. Arthur Weigel wrote about the feelings connected with opening the tomb and he said imagine entering a townhouse which had been closed for the summer. Imagine the stuffy room, the stiff, silent appearance of the furniture, the feeling that some ghostly occupants of the vacant chairs have just been disturbed, the desire to throw open the windows and let life into a room once more. It was perhaps the first sensation as we stood, really dumbfounded, and stared around at the relics of the life of over 3,000 years ago. Yeah, some of those guys uh, had a way that I don't, you know, it makes you think, what, how many drafts did he go through whenever he would write like that? You know, that's the way the people spoke back then. They had an elegant way. They used more vocabulary. It was discovered in 1905 by James E. Kival, 
who worked under the direction of Theodore Davis, a man who was a blessing and a curse for early excavations in Egypt. Oh no, they're going to do a operation thing. Davis treated the sites in Egypt like an amusement park. He ex excavated too much, too fast, and too often, and uh, was thought about, and without thought, about saving heritage. And uh, yeah, nowadays we go through it in a fine tooth comb, layer by layer, and where everything was and stuff, and somebody that's Sherlock Holmes about it might be able to go, yeah, these used to be standing up over here, and this fell over here, and all that type of stuff. And I guess it's important, and the reason it's important that I really think that it's important if you think about this fact is that the people that didn't get to stand there when that wasn't there later with a diagram and all the stuff about it can see exactly the pieces that were where they were and can some, do some Sherlock about it if you just say all this stuff came from there that's so le much less valuable than knowing where things maybe have said or the way things were and things like that so, and archaeology has taken another step. Yes, we've refined our own sciences many times over. The priest checked the state of the damage and, see, uh, and sealed at least two times. So apparently it had been double sealed. However, it seems the tomb robbers were not interested in the treasures, which are so priceless to archaeologists. So it was amazing whenever they tomb robbed what they must have taken, for they left all this stuff. The seal was broken twice. So was this actually just to bring Thuya and Yuyu together and so on? And bring a secondary set of artifacts in there. But then what's the twice? So here's a look at the male, Yuyu's, uh, giant coffin here that really pretty much squared off and inside of it is one that's a little more anthropomorphic or body shape but you can see the size of a person standing next to it and they go oh my god he must have been a Cro-Magnon giant or whatever and it's like no but yes doesn't it portray that image but in that real stance there um, and there were some Egyptians over six foot and hey in that uh, graveyard that I showed you recently that they've got them separated with blondes in one area and redheads in another and stuff they found an over seven foot tall man and I uh, suppose they're doing genetics and seeing if he has that megalomania type gene thing going on or whatever but inside of this was one that looked much more like this inside of this was one that looked even more like what we saw not standing up but laying down a minute ago or is that the laying down one I think that's the laying down one, and we're looking at it at a side odd angle. Outer coffin discovered in the golden third innermost coffin of you. Yeah, okay, so right. The burial chamber isn't anything unusual. It's a typical chamber from the 18th dynasty, however. Something unique about this tomb is the artifacts it held with overwhelming treasure discovered in the inside tomb contained everything that the Egyptologists would dream of. First of all, there were very well preserved mummies of Thuya and Yuyu both. Until now, they are some of the best preserved remains discovered in Egypt, all of Egypt. However, the mummy of Thuya was damaged during the famous destruction of the Museum of Cairo in 2011. And if you look at this, whenever they look at it pretty much face on and all the pictures they had, and they actually took this out of the coffin and did a forensic looking uh, examination of him and back in and took pictures of it. I don't want to go over there to show it now, but Maybe you can tell about his honker nose that sticks out there, and he looks remarkably like Abraham Lincoln. A lot of people have said and said, well, you know what? This one looks like that. That one looks like that. Well, he probably would have been a much fatter-faced person until he sucked up and dried into the beef jerky that he is. And you can see, again, his blonde, curly hair that's there. And whenever they show a picture, a lot of times they'll do it like this, and you can't really see that hair. And they want you to film it that way. In fact, I've got a clip coming up that shows you the extra stuff that was found in Tutankhamen's Commons and all these different shopty dolls with blue eyes and things like that that you've never seen out on exhibit. But whenever they film her, they even go a little worse than this, and they're like, film everything but the hair, don't they? Or you can tell they've almost done that. Mummies were partly unwrapped. But according to Kyle, Yuyu's features were per perfectly preserved. He was overwhelmed by the magnificent face of a man who died thousands of years ago. He had blue glass and quartz eyes, which were made his face look even more alive. The mummy was placed in the nest 
of four coffins. One of these walls was in rectangular shape, while the other three were anthropoid. So shell inside a shell inside a shell, kind of like a Russian doll. That kind of concept. But he had blue glass and quartz eyes. And you can't tell it there, but those are supposedly that. If you get up real close and look at it, you can tell they were done that way, but they're covered with muck of a hundred lifetimes. And if you can look in that slit right there, you can still see his work. Apparently during the forensic diagnosis and identification. Um, one of these was in rectangular shape while the other three are anthropoid. The faces of both mummies were covered in the impressive mass made of cartonage, linen stiffened with plaster. That's the first mass that we showed in the first place. The one which belonged to Thuy was broken but later restored by etheologists. So it just, it had cracked. Apparently it got knocked over and busted and stuff. Maybe during that 2011 stuff or I don't, I don't know what they're referring to there. No, you weren't an Egyptian. Apart from the mummies, archaeologists discovered anthropoid coffins, a box coffin, mummy bands, uh, headpieces, amulets, scarabs, a canopy box coffin, truncated cones, canoptic chests, canoptic jars, which had the different, you know, gods on them and stuff, Osiris beds, shabdi, shabdi boxes, shabdi tools, magical statues, papyri, model coffins, scribe pallets, Osiris, Cenotaphs, Chariots. She's got a real badass chariot, but apparently it's not the one that's on exhibit. That's another one. Whipstocks, beds, a ba bird, which is like a ibis, golden chairs, wigs and wig baskets, mirrors, cistrums, coal tubes, mats, sandals, staves, pottery and stone vessels, jars with embalming products, meat boxes, remains and plants, jewelry, drum vessels, small seals, and many other goods. Damn, that's just a list there. But, uh, and some of these may have other people's names on them, one we'll fix and show you. And that's because they're gifts done by those people, it seems, and by the dynasties or by the succeeding kings and things like that. One of the most impressive artifacts discovered in the tomb was a complete and well preserved chariot. It's believed that it may have been the best preserved chariot in the world. It's not that decorated, but it is beautiful in its simplicity with the spirals and rosettes and gilded plaster. It is a striking artifact. Moreover, the jewelry boxes decorated with ivory, faience, and ebony were inscribed with golden letters. So it's interesting to note that some of the artifacts carry the names Amenhotep III, like this box does here, and his wife, Tai. It seems that Yuya and Thuya were not only the queen's parents, but also very important people in the court and the lineage. And the chairs discovered in the tomb are impressive ones found in Tutankhamun's tomb. They are so magnificent that one of them was used during the opening of the Suez Canal as the seat for an Empress Eugenie. Fortunately, this mistake has not been repeated, and now all the artifacts are still located in the museum. Look at this fine woodworking, and how that table I've got right there has really got that same lip and everything around it. It doesn't have the Egyptian blue. but uh, So they were the parents of gods, basically. Yu and Thuya were very important people in Amenhotep III's court. Uh, Akhenaten, they had at least one famous child, Queen Tai, who became one of the key women in the Theban court. And additionally, it seems they were also the parents of the pharaoh, Ai, and also the grandparents of Tutankhamun. But they have been, uh, also, they could have been Nefertiti and Mutnajemet's grandparents. So this is a huge connection. Without the artifacts, their tomb is of little interest these days. However, it comes to be a monument of the memory of the important couple. They are the ancestors of the people who created some of the most fascinating stories in ancient Egypt, and it's possible that future researchers may even add more details to their truth and story about these blue-eyed, blonde, red-haired, and Caucasian Egyptians. Anyhow, guys, that's it. Let's, uh, let's close that here. Peace.